Well, everyone should have a tools for evangelism manual. Does anyone not have one? Everyone should also have a name tag. If you don't have one, it means one of two things. You haven't registered or the printer malfunction in addition to the uh, air conditioner malfunction uh, caused the loss of your name tag. So you can see the folks at, in the entryway later on if you need uh, a name tag. But if you don't have a Tools for Evangelism manual, you'll want to get that right now. I, I want to welcome back the friends we made from last year. It's great to see you here tonight. It, it's been sweet to partner with you throughout this last year in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, it is some of the sweetest fellowship. In fact, I'll just say it openly. I think it's the very best fellowship there is on the planet out there on the front line fighting the good fight for the souls of men, united together in Christ's work, united together in that for which he lived, died, and rose again, and lives even now at the right hand of the Father. And so, welcome back. Great to see you. I look forward to, to meeting new friends this year, making new friends this year, stepping out in faith with those friends in Christ this year, and uh, partnering as the Lord allows in the, in the year to come to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ in the greater Portland area. I challenge you to be at as many of the outreaches as possible. They, they are voluntary, of course. No one's arm will be twisted or harmed in any way. But I challenge you, I encourage you, stretch your faith, step out, and see what the Lord will do, and be blessed this week. And truly also make uh, friendships, new friendships out there together serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So at this time, if you'll open up your manual, the tools for evangelism together, you see the contents there. Uh, the first three titles under contents, evangelism, sovereignty, evangelism's weapon, and evangelism's spiritual warfare. And when we actually get to the content, you'll see it's all directly from the Word of God. And we're going to try to lay a foundation tonight under those three titles. On a Sunday morning, a given Sunday morning in this pulpit, I preach expositionally a given text, uh, unpacking and delivering that truth. I'm going to preach essentially the entire Bible just tonight and one night under these three topics. Not really, I'm exaggerating a bit, but mining the Bible under these three topics, assaulting your hearts and minds under these three topics, uh, looking to do heart surgery and and looking to uh, build our zeal and our understanding in these three areas of evangelism. is a foundation to everything else that I will teach, and really is a foundation to everything you will do uh, under the title and in the service of our King in evangelism. And so turn the page, if you would, to page three, and what you find there is evangelism's sovereignty, evangelism's sovereignty. And I will not preach to you tonight the doctrine of Calvinism, I'll preach you tonight the doctrines of the Holy Scripture, and you can call them Calvinism if you wish, but I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a receiver and a preacher of the Word of God, and I exhort you to do the same. But the first point is evangelism sovereignty, and evangelism sovereignty is the foundation of biblical evangelism. Evangelism sovereignty is the foundation of the confidence that you should have when you step out, step up, or sit down next to someone to bring to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, and Charles Spurgeon by many is, has been said to be uh, the, the chief of soul winners as well as the chief of preachers or the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon in his book, The Soul Winner, which if you don't have, you need to have a classic. Charles Spurgeon said, uh, soul winning is the chief business of every Christian. Indeed, it should be the main pursuit of every true believer. We should each say with Simon Peter, I go fishing, John 21, 3. And our aim should be along with Paul that I might by all means save some. Charles Spurgeon also said, God save us from living in comfort while sinners are sinking into hell. He had a passion for lost sinners. He had a passion that men and women and boys and girls would turn from sin and look unto Jesus Christ and be born again from above. That they would lay down their arms and that they would take up hymnals of praise and serve 
Christ our King. Charles Spurgeon is fairly well known for being a phenomenal preacher of Christ and a phenomenal preacher of Christ's gospel, but he is less known, less known for his passion for the doctrines of grace, his passion for the sovereignty of God and salvation, his passion for the sovereignty of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Dr. Steve Lawson's book, The Gospel Focus of Charles Spurgeon, again, centering in on that singular issue that defines Spurgeon, the gospel focus, in that book, there's a chapter titled Sovereign Grace, page 39. It says, herein was the power of Spurgeon's gospel message. Ian Murray writes, the strength of Spurgeon's ministry lay in his theology. He rediscovered that the church, what the church had largely forgotten, the evangelistic power of so-called Calvinistic doctrine. Spurgeon looked upon these truths as the driving force of a gospel ministry. And friends, you and I need to do the same. We need to look to God, all sovereign in the salvation of men. We need to look to God who is saving some from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. And go forth proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ with a certain confidence that men and women, boys and girls, will be saved. Not by chance or happenstance, but by the sovereign design of God. Now, I could preach this singular topic the entire weekend. In fact, this entire week and an entire month, and probably for months to come. And this is just one point tonight. So we will go to the Lord Jesus. There are many places we could go in the Scripture. But look to Luke chapter 5. Look to Luke chapter 5 as we consider a thorough knowledge and commitment to the sovereign grace of God and salvation, providing the evangelist, that's you and I, with the necessary foundation from which to minister the Word of God with confidence and conviction. Rejecting or underemphasizing God's sovereignty and salvation inevitably leads to a man-centered, compromised gospel message and a manipulative, evangelistic, seeker-centered methodology. In Luke 5, we find something totally other, something that is not man-centered, something that is not man-manufactured. Look to Luke 5, 1 through 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he, Jesus, stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, "Depart Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord." For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Now, some read right over this passage and miss entirely the lesson of God's sovereignty in evangelism. But friends, I would ask that we pause here briefly tonight and see that the Lord Jesus was teaching in Simon Peter's boat. The Lord Jesus finished his teaching in verse 4, and he said, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And now it's midday. Simon answered quite reasonably and said to the Lord Jesus, Master, which is a wonderful word to use, opening your sentence, speaking to the Lord Jesus in response. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now what comes after the word master is not really flowing with the word master. Master. 
You and I often call the Lord Jesus Master in one sense or another, with one form of the word or another, usually perhaps Lord. Right? Lord, Master, Sovereign, King, Master. We have toiled all night and caught nothing. Friends, let's call Him Master and let's serve Him as Master. Let's call Him Master and obey Him as Master without reservation. Here, Peter, early in his instruction, has reservation. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, still to this day, so many centuries after Peter learned his lesson, still to this day, much of the church is saying, Master, and giving the Lord Jesus lip service, and yet beginning to very timidly argue against his command, his design. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. What is that? That, that is not ready submission. That is not glad submission. That is an argument against the plan, the command of Jesus. We've toiled all night and caught nothing. What is the thought behind that? Well, the time to fish is at night. Everyone knows that. The time to fish at night with a net we cast out that the fish are, are going to see and swim away from. Um, is it night? Not in midday. The fish are all gone. The fish are not here. We fished all night. This place is fished out. They certainly won't be here in the day. We've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, with some reservation, at your word, I will let down the net. Dear saints, at the word of Jesus, let's learn to let down the net gladly, readily, without any reservation, without any caution, with, with, without any argument as to the effectiveness of letting down the net. Let us simply believe the Lord Jesus and let down the net when He says to let it down, where He says to let it down, how He says to let it down, despite what our human ingenuities or expertise would tell us is the best plan for fishing master we have toiled all night and caught nothing nevertheless at your word i will let down the net and when they had done this they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking it was breaking they didn't get a few fish for lunch their nets were breaking, but wait, there's more. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. The net was breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come help them. And then they came and filled both boats, two boats full. This is huge. This is the hand of God. God is sovereign and fishing. That's the lesson here, right, men? All right, let's go fishing. God is sovereign and fishing. Fishing for the souls of men. And when he is in it, 3,000 are saved and baptized in a day. And when he is in it, you'll be stripped, you'll be whipped, you'll be stocked, you'll be cast to the inmost prison, there'll be guards on all sides, or you'll lose your life for preaching the same message that the day before God was pleased to save 3,000 souls with. Same method, same message. God is sovereign. Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, we'll let down the net. The net is full. The boats are full. But wait, they begin to sink. That's how full they are. They begin to sink. I think of the 3,000 saved there after the day of Pentecost. The church would begin to sink, right? We just don't have the infrastructure for this. We, we don't have elders for this. We don't have deacons for this. Who's going to keep that air conditioning going? The boat begins to sink. Verse 8, Simon Peter saw it, and he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. His sovereignty, his omnipotence, his omniscience was evident, so evident that Peter is broken. Peter falls upon his face before him, feeling the weight of his humanity in the form of conviction of sin. I am a sinful man, O Lord. And all that are with them are astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And the Lord Jesus says to them, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Do not be afraid. 
From now on, you'll catch men. This is not a lesson about slimy, wet things in the sea. It's not even a a simple lesson about the Lord Jesus' omniscience, right? The Lord Jesus is not the uh, heaven-sent fish finder for us men. The Lord Jesus is sovereign over the catch of men's souls. He is sovereign over the method. He is sovereign over the message. And when He says to cast, where He says to cast, how He says to cast, we cast. Without reservation. Without nevertheless. Without excuse of having toiled all night and caught nothing. We tried that yesterday. It didn't work. You know what? 3,000 were not saved in downtown Portland today. But we're going back tomorrow. And 3,000 just might be saved. And we better believe it. Because the Lord may be pleased to do it. All throughout the history of the church, the word of God was preached publicly and boldly. And the Lord was pleased at times to bring suffering and persecution, trial and tribulation upon the church through that bold proclamation of the gospel. And at other times, He was pleased to save entire villages, cities, seemingly nations the same method and the same message. Heralding forth, casting the net as far and wide as is humanly possible. Jump with me, if you will, to John 6, 36-40. Under evangelism sovereignty, we see the Lord Jesus more expressly teaching theology here. The Lord Jesus has been Instructing his disciples in the context of having fed the 5,000. And the 5,000 following him, men, women, children, well over 5,000. But some number of that 5,000 following him across the lake the next day and they want their bellies filled again. And in John 6, 36 it says, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe All that the Father gives me come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. Of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up, I will raise him up at the last day day John 6 36 through 40 first point out of that I said to you that you have seen me friends the Lord Jesus went to the 5,000 plus women and children right massive number maybe 20,000 easily went to them and preached the gospel went to them spent some time in their midst and fed them fed them miraculous bread and miraculous fish like they had never experienced before. All their bellies were full and there was leftovers. This was amazing. Something they had never experienced in their lives. The Lord Jesus is perfect in power, perfect in wisdom, perfect in character, perfect in love, perfect in His message. You and I cannot begin in one single instant of our lives To be like Jesus was in their midst for hours and days. We can't begin in one single message, in one single point, or one single moment of a message to preach how the Lord Jesus preached. We can't begin to love how the Lord Jesus loved. And yet, what was the response? You have seen me and yet do not believe. Please understand that you cannot be sweet enough. You cannot be kind enough. You cannot be friendly enough. You you cannot make your service seeker enough to convince sinners to repent and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Jesus is perfect in every facet of that word. Every possible application of that word. And yet, after he was with them, after they 
experienced that perfection, after they heard His perfect message, they did not believe. What is the explanation of that? Is it that Jesus failed? He wasn't really a good preacher after all? No, it's not at all. The explanation of it. The explanation is in verse 37. Right on the heels of yet you do not believe, Jesus says, the Lord Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So what is the reality? The reason they do not believe is because they were not given unto him or they would have come. That is his express point. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. You can call it Calvinism or you can call it the perseverance of the saints and the preservation of the saints. You can call it Calvinism or you can, you can call it election. You can call it the Father giving to the Son. And all who are given, they come. Verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. Of all He has given me, I should lose nothing. Of all He has given me, He should lose nothing. And so all who are given will come, and all who come will not be lost. And remember, Jesus is speaking to a group of people that He just spent time with They saw his perfect power, they heard his perfect wisdom, they experienced his perfect love, and they rejected him. This is his explanation. Verse 40, and this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And it's true, everyone who sees him and believes upon him will have everlasting life. Absolutely. But who will see and who will believe? He's talking to a group of people who saw but did not believe. And he says to them, all that the Father gives me will come. They will believe. Look to John 6.44. 6.44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In the positive, he says all that the Father gives me will come. In the negative, he says no one can. That's That's ability. We have not the ability. Again, call it Calvinism or call it the Lord Jesus clear instruction. We are depraved. And in our total depravity, no one seeks God. Is that doctrine or is that a quote of Romans 3, 9 and 10? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How depraved are we? We're so depraved that we will never seek him. We're so depraved that we don't want Him. He is offensive to us. You want to know how depraved humanity is? Stand publicly and proclaim the Gospel. And you'll see how appalled unregenerate sinners are except by the grace of God. There were so many standing out there today intently watching and listening. And that gives me great Profound hope that the Lord is calling them. Because there are others reviling and angry. And either response is wonderful. Because it means they heard. They heard the gospel. They heard of the one true God and that He is holy. And that we are His creatures and we're in rebellion. And He will judge sin. And they heard that there is one means of salvation. One Name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, but they must repent and bend their knee and confess Him as Lord, Master, to be saved. And for every one of them that stood seemingly enthralled, I'm praying the Lord is bringing them, He is calling them, if not today, tomorrow, next week, ten years from now. And to all those who reviled and were angry, I'm praying that the gospel was especially painful to them because they're in the death throes of self. And they too will soon bend the knee to Christ and confess Him as Lord. But this I know because Jesus said it. This I know and you know because Jesus said it. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. And this gives me incredible confidence in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
both the positive and the negative. Verse 37, all who the Father gives me will come. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether it's in the lunchroom or on the street, whether it's in the nursery with your child or whether it's with your adult child at Christmas. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that the Father gives will come. Look to John 6, 60-71. At the end of verse 61, the Lord Jesus, after saying you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, which is not a literal statement, but figurative, that you must receive the sacrifice of His broken body and shed blood by grace through faith. He says, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where He was before? And then verse 63 is pivotal. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Nothing. Why? Because it's depraved. It's depraved. It's at enmity with God. No one in the flesh seeks God. If any man, woman, or child is seeking God, it's because the grace of God is profoundly and manifestly moving upon them to seek Him. It is the Spirit who gives life. The Spirit of God must move upon them. The Spirit of God must regenerate them. If you see genuine repentance and genuine confession of Jesus Christ as Lord, it is the genuine work of the Holy Spirit because the flesh profits nothing would repentance be profitable oh yes is a confession of jesus christ profitable infinitely and the flesh profits nothing it is the work of god it is the grace of god now let's put a capstone on this i don't have time to unpack these texts in their fullness but look to john 10 john 10 again the lord jesus and mind you we could go to the apostle paul And some struggle with the Apostle Paul because they struggle with the sovereignty of God. So I've taken you to the Lord Jesus because it's harder to struggle for some against the Lord Jesus. But the Word of God is equally the Word of God whether the Apostle Paul inspired of the Holy Spirit penned it or whether Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John inspired of the Holy Spirit penned the words of the Lord Jesus in the Gospels. But here is John 10, 23-30. The Lord Jesus and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered and said to them, I told you and you do not believe me. Sounds a lot like John 6, doesn't it? I fed you. I, I did the miracle of the loaves and fish. I taught you. I was in your midst and yet you don't believe. He said in John 6. Here, here, They say, just go ahead and tell us plainly if you're the Christ. He says, look, I told you, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe. I have told you, I have shown you, and yet you don't believe. Friends, can you tell better than Jesus? Can you show them better than Jesus? Can you raise Lazarus from the dead? Really? If you can feed 5,000 men plus families... Out of a few loaves of bread and fish, come with me tomorrow. That will be awesome. But you know what? That would not help one sinner come one inch closer to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That is not the power of God to salvation. The Lord Jesus in their presence did infinite miracles. He all but eradicated. In fact, you could really say he eradicated disease from Jerusalem and Israel beyond. And not just disease, but but lameness. And I don't mean bad jokes. Lame in the hand, lame in the foot, lame in the head. Demon possession. True, legitimate handicaps. Born blind, congenital blindness from birth. Four days dead in the tomb. Old Lazarus, right? He stinketh, Lord. (laughs) Lazarus, come out. Can you improve upon that? No, you cannot. 
And yet I told you, and yet you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe. Friends, it's not a matter of evidence. They don't have an evidence problem. They have a heart problem, a heart that Jeremiah declares very clearly is a stone. It's a rock. It's dead. They need a heart transplant. And that comes to the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what Jesus was saying in verse 63 of chapter 6. It is the Spirit who gives life. Not you. Not me. Not a sandwich. It's the Spirit who gives life. Back to verse 26 of chapter 10. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. In chapter 6, he said, you do not believe. In verse 36, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And then in verse 64 or 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. In chapter 10, uh, he says... I've told you I'm the Christ, but you don't believe. I've shown you with power that I'm the Christ through my works, but you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. Sheep here is elect. The reason you don't believe, even though I've shown you, even though I've told you the truth, is because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, just like in chapter 6, verse 27, as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. Just today, I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stepped aside. Tony stepped up. He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another man steps up. He says, hey, that guy's a something or other. And uh, I thought he was talking about the Lord, actually. I didn't hear that that guy. And I said, sir, that's blasphemy, and you must repent of your parish and your sins of blasphemy before a holy God. And he said, no, I meant him. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I, what he's saying isn't so bad. But it's how he says it. He's, a jerk. And I said, well, how exactly? And it was the simple truths of God's holiness, our sinfulness, and the exclusivity of Christ that was so offensive. It wasn't that anything in Tony's mannerism was offensive. It was the truth of the gospel that was so offensive. And, and he said, well, you should really just be nice to people and talk to people. And, but preaching it, Harold, you know, it's just going to turn people off. They're going to go further from God. Even if one got saved, you'd turn a thousand off. And I said, no, sir, you, you don't understand who God is, nor do you understand who man is. No one here today will be saved except that God called them. This is on the street talking to a man with a skull necklace, little skulls all around. No, sir, except that the Lord give them ears to hear, no one will come. No one will come. And here's what we know for certain. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is not going to harden anyone's sin or heart. Their heart is already infinitely hard. It's already a dead rock. If there is hope of them being saved, it's through the Word of God. Because the Spirit of God in the design of God's sovereign salvation, in the Spirit of God, is pleased to illumine His Word to those whom the Lord is calling to Himself. Again, chapter 6, verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Verse 37, All who the Father gives me will come. Everyone there whom the Lord is calling will come. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. That's what I said to the man on the street. Those whom the Lord is calling, they'll hear the voice of the Lord Jesus, not Tony Miano. Oh, it's it's his voice, but it's the word of God. They'll hear it as the very living word of God through the power of the spirit of God. And they will come and they will follow Jesus. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Verse 28, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. The parallels with chapter 6 are uncanny. God is sovereign in salvation. Man cannot affect his own salvation, and you cannot affect the salvation of another. Not by being sweet, kind, wise, intellectual, simple, loving, friendly, innovative, There is nothing we can do to manufacture or manipulate repentance and saving faith. God is sovereign in salvation. 
Our simple response is to say, nevertheless, at your will, I'll let down the net. When, where, how, you say to, O Lord, and let God be sovereign in the fish that he puts in the net. Cast the net, let God fill it. Or let God allow you to pull it back up empty and praise God for the opportunity to cast the net today. I'll come back again tomorrow. Because they had fished all night, right? And caught nothing. Jump forward. Jump forward, John 21. John 21. The end of the Gospels. The end of the Gospel account, right? John 21. The Lord Jesus has died. The Lord Jesus has risen again. The Lord Jesus has not yet ascended. I mean, some pivotal things have happened. The Lord Jesus is still on the earth, looking like the Lamb who was slain, for indeed He was, and yet He is alive. Peter's sitting around with the other apostles, and he says what? I'm going fishing. Nothing happening here. I'm going fishing. That's what he says in verse 3. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you. Peter is a leader. People follow. They go. They went out and immediately got into the boat. That night, they caught nothing. A big, fat zero. Remind you of something about Luke 5. They caught nothing. Verse 4, when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. But Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast And now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. At the beginning of the Lord Jesus' ministry, at the outset of calling the disciples, and specifically Simon Peter, right, in his boat, he said, cast the net. At an unlikely time, unlikely place, unlikely method and peter kind of argued nevertheless i'll do it at the end of the lord jesus ministry after he has died risen not yet ascended peter goes off course hey i'm going fishing he's out in the boat they catch nothing the lord doesn't bless it why because what did jesus say to peter in luke 5 after they sank two boats for now on you will catch men peter get out of that boat You fish on land for now on. So Peter's in the boat. Peter's fishing. They catch nothing. The Lord Jesus, resurrected Lord Jesus, comes. He says, cast on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. They cast. And they're not even this time able to get the load to get the net back into the boat. Verse 7 Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! It's John who says, It is the Lord! And Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment and he plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. They never did get it into the boat. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. Although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing it was the Lord? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself. You walked where you wished. When you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you to where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter, get out of that boat. Don't ever go back. Tend my sheep. Find 
my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. They will come. Go find my sheep. When you were younger, you went where you wanted. You went fishing when you wanted, how you wanted, where you wanted. When you're older, you're going to stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. You're going to die preaching this gospel, Peter. Get out of the boat. Don't go back. You're a fisher of men now. Go find my sheep. Go, Peter. Do you love me, Peter? Get out of the boat. Do you love me, Peter? Fish for men. Cast the net when, where, and how I say. For the glory of the Father. For the glory of the Son and His cross. For the souls of men. And all whom the Father gives will come. Now I'd like to talk to Ephesians 1 and 2, Romans 9 and 10, and the beautiful relationship between the pinnacle of sovereignty in Romans 9 and what could be called the pinnacle of our responsibility and our privilege in going forth with feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace in chapter 10. But there's no time for that. We've laid the groundwork for evangelism sovereignty. If you have questions, come to me afterwards. If this is challenging to you, you know not of the doctrines of grace, you know not of God's sovereignty and salvation, come and talk. I'd be happy to talk with you, point you to some more resources to that end. But let me tell you again that the prince of preachers believed in the sovereignty of God, and it was part of the foundation of his ministry. And indeed, he did. If the great... Fishermen of souls, Charles Spurgeon believed in the sovereignty of God and it was part of the foundation of his gospel ministry and it was, then friends, this is no enemy. This doctrine, this truth of God's word is no enemy. It is the sweetest friend of a gospel zeal. Again, then, Steve Lawson's book, this time uh, on Whitfield, the evangelistic zeal of George Whitfield. George Whitfield, perhaps the most prolific gospel preacher since the Apostle Paul himself, and that's not an overstatement. George Whitfield was arguably the most prolific evangelist since the time of the Apostles, yet at the same time he was also a staunch Calvinist. Undergirding his passionate gospel preaching was an unwavering belief in God's sovereignty and man's salvation. It was the doctrines of grace that ignited his soul with holy compulsion to reach the world with the message of Christ. Some argue that these two realities, sovereign grace and evangelistic zeal, cannot coexist, but nothing can be further from the truth. They meet perfectly in Scripture, and they existed side by side in Whitfield's ministry. Where do they meet perfectly in Scripture? Romans 9 and 10. Beautiful. He went on on Whitfield to say it could be said of what Whitfield believed and preached. It was Calvinism aflame, and Whitfield carried it passionately to the nations. This he did perhaps better than any who ever lived. With ardent desire to see Christ exalted, Whitfield wrote a letter to a friend that best summarized his deep convictions. The doctrines of our election and free justification in Christ Jesus fill my soul with a holy fire and afford me great confidence in God my Savior. I hope we shall catch fire from each other and that there shall be a holy emulation amongst us who shall most debase man and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Who? That's the challenge. Who of us shall most debase man and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing but the Reformation can do this. I know that Christ is all in all. Man is nothing. He hath a free will to go to hell, but none to go to heaven, till God worketh in him to will and to do of his good pleasure." Man has no will to go to heaven until God worketh to will and to do of His good pleasure. Evangelism sovereignty. Foundation laid. Therefore, we can go forth and cast the net when, where, and how the Lord says to and be confident He'll fill it when He desires. To capacity 
to overflowing. Or it'll be pulled back up empty. And God is sovereign in all of it. And we need only look back in the history of the church to see that reality played out. Starting in the book of Acts. Is that not the history of the church? Again, one day, 3,000 souls are saved. Another day, they're stripped, they're whipped, they're stalked, placed in the inmost chamber. Same message, same method, same net, cast in the same manner. Evangelism's weapon. Evangelism's weapon. Second point, much faster than the first. Evangelism's weapon, intimately connected to evangelism's sovereignty. You see, when we are confident in the sovereignty of God, we can believe God that His weapon will work according to His purpose and desire. The Word of God is evangelism's singular and most powerful weapon. If you internalize the basic biblical concepts in this manual, you'll be well equipped for the, for the evangelistic battle. Notice that we utilize God's Word rather than man-made evangelistic theory, strategy, or philosophy. The Holy Scriptures supply our evangelistic message and method because they alone are guaranteed to succeed in winning the souls of men. The power and plan are found in the Word. Look to Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine. God is speaking to you. Is not my word like a fire? Don't respond, I beg you, like Peter. Oh, well, we fished with that word all night. We went out with that word all last week. We tried that last year. And Portland isn't saved yet. Seattle isn't saved yet. Los Angeles isn't saved yet. There's a few unsaved folks left down there. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Would we argue with God? No. We say yes and amen. It is the fire of God. It is the hammer of God. And nothing can stand against it. We believe God. And thus we proclaim the word of God because it is the very fire of God. And the very hammer of God. To burn and to break everything, everything that would stand against the one true God and His Son, Jesus Christ. To burn and to break down our self-righteousness. In order that we would come to the end of self and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. That was my argument today with the man on the street. Look, you're not offended at him. You're offended at the words that he's speaking. But those for whom the Lord has given ears to hear, they will receive it and receive it gladly. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. How horrific of us, how blasphemous of us to say, no, Lord, Casting that net will scare away the fish. I won't do that. No, it shall not return void. It shall accomplish what I please. It shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Cast the net. Preach the word. God is sovereign in the ministry of His word. Romans ten seventeen. If this is not burnt into your soul... May it be so after this day. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Can we not believe God? Or will will we perpetually, we the church today, perpetually respond like Peter on kind of day one of his ministry, right? Oh Lord, you know, we've, we've fished all night. Nevertheless, all right, we'll keep ministering the word. But we'll try this stuff too. We'll enhance the word with a carnival and call it church. We'll enhance the word with rated R movie clips and call it church. We'll enhance the word with incredible intellect and call it church. We'll enhance the word with with bologna sandwiches and call it church. Call it evangelism. No, it's just bologna. 
Baloney doesn't enhance the word. How can you enhance anything that's perfect? You cannot. You add anything to that which is perfect, what have you done to it? At best, diluted it. At best. But in reality, you've corrupted it. If you give them a bologna sandwich, great, fine, wonderful. You've loved them. Super. And yet you still have not loved them with the perfect love that the Lord Jesus loved them with when he fed the 5,000. Nor did you miraculously make the bologna sandwich. You have not helped the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hear that. Believe that. And that will set you free to minister effectively. Second Timothy 3.15 From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The Holy Scriptures, whether you're a child, right? So we should teach children the Holy Scriptures, or a man. The Holy Scriptures make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Oh, that we would believe God and minister them, proclaim them, preach them, teach them, share them. Unleash them. Verse 16 might be the why. The why. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is Holy Spirit inspired. It is theonoustos. It is God breathed. 1 Corinthians 1. The Holy Spirit takes that same word that He originally breathed and He illumines it. He illumines that word. 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. And what what is the gospel to the perishing? It's foolishness. What is the gospel to those who are being saved? 1 Corinthians 1 says. It is the power and the wisdom of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And all of God's people need to say yes and amen. Not, well, we fished all night with that. And really, Lord, it's kind of stink bait. The fish aren't liking it. It's driving the fish away. That's blasphemy. No, it is the Holy Spirit inspired Word of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. It will make the man of God complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, especially the work of the gospel, the work of evangelism. Is God's Word not complete? Does it not make you complete for every good work, thoroughly equipped for every good work? Yes, it does. So let's believe, God, that it will make children, men, and women wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6.17, we'll skip for now, we'll come back to it in a little while. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Friends, today... So many of us, so often, we march as if to war with a spork. Or or maybe on a good day, one of those really fine Costco plastic knives out of that really excellent set, you know, those heavy-duty things. And we're marching to war, and we're so confident that this is going to do the trick. It's blasphemy. But believe God that the Word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. There is no weapon that can be fashioned on the face of the earth like the Word of God. Oh, that we would believe God and unleash it, that it's a fire, that it's a hammer, that it shall not return void, that it will make men wise for salvation, that it's a sharp two-edged sword, that it's living and powerful. 
James 1.21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What is able to save your soul? The implanted word. What are we to do with the word of God? Implant it. Get it in there. Get it in. Unleash it. Preach it. Speak it, share it, write it. 1 Peter 1.23 Having been born again through an excellent, high-speed, seeker-sensitive church service. Oh, sorry, that's not what it says. Having been born again through the sweetest and kindest lady you ever did meet. Doesn't say that either. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed. Friends, anything else we bring other than the Word of God is corruptible seed. It's corruptible seed. We think we're smarter than God. We've got a better plan than God. We've we've figured out something that that God didn't know. We've got an insight that God needs. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, that's all corruptible, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. It's not stuffy. It's not dusty. It's not archaic. It lives. It abides forever. It is incorruptible. Everything else is corruptible. Everything. All our plans. All our ingenuities. Because all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withers, its flower falls, falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. How are we to carry forth the gospel? Preach the word. Speak the word. Write the word. Give them the incorruptible Living Word of God. The fire, the hammer, that which, shall, that, which, that which shall not return void. The Holy Scriptures. Did you catch that in 2 Timothy 3.15? I didn't pause there. Holy Scriptures. You can't serve them a holy sandwich. The sword of the Spirit. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Living and powerful. Implant that word that is able to save their souls. Martin Luther described the Reformation in this simple manner. He said, I simply taught, preached, wrote God's word. Taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then while I slept, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or emperor did such to damage it. I did nothing. The word did it all. That's a healthy conviction. You want to be effective for the kingdom of Christ. You want to be effective in advancing the gospel. You want to be effective in seeing men genuinely born again from above, not something we've manufactured. Then get a hold of this. I did nothing. The word did it all. When you get a hold of that conviction, you'll give this up. You won't dress your pastor in a bunny suit, or worse yet, your pastor won't dress himself in a bunny suit and invite people out in the most seeker-centered, hip fashion for Easter to come for a casual atmosphere, cool stuff, and no perfect people allowed. You won't do your annual Easter outreach your super evangelistic outreach by sending out flyers that say Easter doesn't have to be a drag and show a traditional, beautiful church building and a mother with a Bible in her hand and a father with, you know, a suit that proves he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Dragging the poor boy to church. No doubt to sit under the preaching of the Word of God. You know that word in 2 Timothy 3.15? The Holy Scriptures? that you have known since childhood, that are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Nor will you find yourself doing this and calling it evangelism. Not your mama's Easter service, dressing your pastor as a female bunny rabbit. We 
We lay the foundation of evangelism in God's sovereignty. We lay the foundation of evangelism in a confidence of God sovereignly using His Word. We cast the net when, where, and how He says to with absolute confidence that we can do nothing and the Word will do it all. As the flesh profits nothing. The Spirit gives life. That's not Martin Luther. That's Jesus Christ. John 6. And why? Why? Because of evangelism, spiritual warfare, the quickest point of all. Only one verse, or chapter. Ephesians 6, evangelism, spiritual warfare. How can we fight a spiritual war? Well, with spiritual instruments in the power of the Spirit of God. Ephesians 6, Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. It's not an option, it's a command. Be strong in the Lord. Well, that's just not my thing. Tough, get over it. Repent. Be strong in the Lord. You're right, you're not strong. If you are strong in self, repent. But you have no right to be weak in the Lord. The Lord is not weak, He is mighty. In fact, He's almighty. When it comes to evangelism, put off the mindset, well, that's just not really for me. You know, and and if you're here today, I trust you don't really... Ascribe to that mindset. The Lord says, be strong in the Lord. In the power of His might. He is mighty. He is powerful. We need to submit gladly unto Him and cry out to the Lord that He fill us with His Spirit that we would be strong in the Lord. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We have a real foe. He is the devil. He is mighty, but not almighty. He is finite. God is infinite. He is a creature. He is evil. He is powerful. He is our enemy. He roams to and fro seeking whom he may devour. He is the enemy of Christ. He is the enemy of the church. He is the enemy of the souls of men. He is real. And He has an army that serves Him. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The Lord has provided armor and we need to put it on. Verse 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle, we wrestle We sweat. We strive. There's a war on and it's hand-to-hand combat. We're not dropping bombs from a thousand miles away. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Scary, isn't it? And yet, we're strong in the Lord, in the power of of his might. And as far as the devil is concerned, one little word shall fell him. But it's real. And in some sense, scary. Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, 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 withstand, stand firm. The idea is, Military, we're not giving up ground. We are the New Testament kingdom of God. And we are to advance the kingdom of God, not retreat. Always advancing the kingdom of God. Never retreating. Years ago in the Marine Corps, there was a concept, not of retreat, but of attacking in the other direction, if necessary. I understand in the midst of the Korean conflict, the Korean War, that at one point, Chesty Puller, when they were utterly surrounded and without hope, said, good, we can attack in any direction. Friends, we're surrounded. The devil and those that serve him, all around. The cults, false religion, all around. And our response is, as a people that are strong in the Lord and the power of His might, with the full armor of God, who are standing firm against the wiles of the devil, is good. We can attack in any direction to advance the kingdom of Christ.
Look to verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Having girded your waist with truth so that your flabby innards won't gush out, right? So that your weak spine will be strong and you'll stand up straight in the day of battle. Gird your waist with truth. Friends, you need a theological understanding. You need, you need some doctrinal grid work. You can't just say in a loosey-goosey way, oh, it's all of Jesus. Yes, it is. Jesus who? Jesus how? Jesus when? Jesus what? A lot of contenders and pretenders out there. We need truth to gird up our waist. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the very righteousness of Christ put on by grace through faith and the certain confidence of that, certain peace of that. We have a new heart. We've been transformed. And now we're walking in righteousness, practical righteousness, as Ryle spoke of, being washed with the water of the Word with a confidence and a a purity that, that frees us to serve the Lord. We cannot serve the Lord well in the field of combat with divided allegiances. Secret sin. Gird in our waist with truth. Put it on the breastplate of righteousness. And having shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Friends, Islam is prepared. Islam is prepared. And they're advancing everywhere with swords. Crying out, Allah Akbar. Advancing everywhere with AK-47s. Crying out, Allah Akbar. Or thousands and thousands of missiles. Uh, launched out of Palestine against Israel under the name of Hamas and again Allah Akbar. Mormons are prepared. They have seminaries next to all of our high schools locally here and they train up their young men and call them elders and send them to all of our doors and people are still converting to Mormonism. Jehovah's Witnesses are highly prepared to twist the Scriptures and present to you a false Christ. The cults and false religions are prepared. Are you? Are we Again, I trust you're here to get prepared. To strap your boots on. To shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. To be ready so that everywhere you go, the gospel goes with you. It bleeds out of you. It is what you exhale. It is what you sweat. You're poked. Out comes the profession of Christ. Your feet carry you through the world to share the gospel that brings the peace of Christ to the world. The Lord's warrior must know the gospel thoroughly, readily, and gladly so that there will be no hesitation in sharing it. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. If you are going to stand up and stand firm and put on the armor of God and walk out to do battle, you need a shield. The devil fights back and he never, ever fights fair. They are fiery barbs. And they're aimed at your heart, your wife's heart, your children's hearts, your boss's heart. They are fiery barbs and you need a shield of faith. Faith. Your faith will be tested, it will be tried, and by God's grace, found true, and at the end of the road, stronger and more vital than ever, so you'll be ready for even greater battle in the days, months, and years to come. The quickest way to grow your faith is to study your soul, yourself approved, be unceasing in prayer, and to step out in battle with the shield of faith, to have it tested and tried, and you will grow. Walk by faith, not by sight. You'll need the shield of faith. The devil's fiery darts will come. The devil, get this, the devil has no darts for soldiers who are AWOL. You may not be familiar with the New Testament referencing all Christians as soldiers who have been enlisted. It's not just because of my marine background. That's the New Testament. We've been enlisted to the army of God. But if we're AWOL, absent without leave, we're not in the fight, we're doing something else, we're in the easy chair of life, we're perpetually on the beach... We, we done did that, got the t-shirt, right? We almost had t-shirts here for the conference. You wouldn't come back next year if we did, though. The devil has no darts for soldiers who are AWOL. The devil is happy to let churches full of AWOL professing believers, some of them real, 
sit idle. He doesn't want to stir them up. Why bother them? They might actually open their Bibles and see that there's something to do other than have your best Friday. Day after day after day. This is boring. Isn't there something worth living for, dying for, expressing some passion for? I mean, once you strip away all the sins that we normally would have passion for, right? What's left? The gospel. Souls. The glory of God. See, most of our passion until we come to know Christ is spent on sin and selfishness and foolishness. Are we to be passionless? Are we having an evangelism conference to to invite up a mild-mannered Tony Miano to teach you how to be mild-mannered witnesses for Christ? No, we've invited an inflamed, passionate, bold evangelist to come and light you on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the souls of men with genuine passion that is worth being spilt and spent. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, the certain, confident assurance of your salvation, again, walking with Christ by grace through faith, His finished work, not our work, what He has done, born again from above, without abiding, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 type, Sins that would say, hey, don't be deceived. If you're living like this, you're not born again from above. If you're still a fornicator, an adulterer, a drunkard, a liar, a swindler, a sodomite, you're not born again from above. Do not be deceived. Put on the helmet of salvation, the certain understanding of Christ, the certain confidence that Christ has born you again from above, that you're a new creature. Protect your head from the blows this world and the devil in it are going to bring to bear upon you. Perhaps most important of all, in fact, I'll just say the most important of all, verse 17, be there, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which takes us back to the previous point, evangelism's weapon, which takes us back to the previous point of evangelism's sovereignty. Because God is sovereign, we can be absolutely confident that evangelism's weapon, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, will not return void. It shall accomplish what He pleases. That when we proclaim it, whether in writing, whether sitting down peaceably at the breakfast table with our family, whether in church or on the street someplace, when we proclaim the living Word of God, it shall do that for which the Lord sent it. All of His sheep will hear His voice and they will come. All the fish that He's calling, they won't be able to get into the net fast enough. You know, gill net me. Take me. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How dare we read this and even hang artwork on our walls that depict it, right? And say, oh, that's, that's awesome. And then not believe it and put it to work. Verse 18, praying always, praying always. Again, Martin Luther, I did nothing, the Word did it all. Yes, the Word did it all, so let's pray that way. Let's pray that way. Let's fight as if it depended upon us. Let's actually get out there in the field of battle and let's wield the sword of the Spirit. Let's share it, let's preach it, let's write it. And let's pray unceasingly, knowing that the Spirit of God must regenerate, knowing that the Spirit of God must illuminate. Let's pray unceasingly. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now right in the, right in the heart of a, of a word from God about warfare, about battle, about striving against the devil, about fighting a good fight, about putting on the full armor of God and taking up the sword of the Spirit is verse 18 about prayer. And I, I hear preachers all the time pluck this out and, and say, we should pray for each other. Dear Lord, bless Tony. Allow him to enjoy his sandwich today at lunch and help him, Lord, to be conscious of those around him and, and not to 
offend his wife by eating her sandwich too. You know, silly prayers. Verse 18 is in the heart of warfare. It's in the heart of battle. It's in the heart of armor. And it just came on the heels of take up the sword. What are we praying for the saints? We're praying that the saints will be the soldiers of God that He's called them to be. And that they'll fight the good fight with the full armor of God, taking up the sword of the Spirit. Verse 19, And for me, says Paul, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the Gospel. How would we divorce verse 18 from verse 19? Verse 18, we're, we're praying for lots of nice things, puppies and butterflies and temporal stuff, boo-boos and band-aids. But verse 19, and for me that utterance may be given to me. It's like, um, you know, Paul was schizophrenic in verse 18. No, he was completely consistent. What are we to be praying for each other? That we will be faithful to fight the good fight, to strive against the devil who is our foe, who is constantly fighting. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly, boldly. Friends, we're all too bold in everything we shouldn't be, and we're all too meek in everything we should be bold in. We need to repent of our boldness in all that is worldly, all that is selfish, all that is born out of self-love, and we need to pray to God that He will make us bold in all that is holy and right and pure, and above all, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for me, says Paul, that I'll be bold as I ought to be bold. I beg you, pray for me. Pray for Tony. Pray for Ken. Pray for Dale. Pray for each and every one of you that this week as we step out in faith and our entire lives will be bold as we ought to be in Christ Jesus. That we'll repent of weakness that we're calling meekness. Rebellious weakness that we like to call spiritual meekness. Pray that I'll be bold as I ought to be bold. Be meek in what we're going to have for lunch, what snacks we're going to have for supper, who took your parking spot, who sat in your favorite seat at church. You be real meek in that and call it spiritual, and it will be. But you be bold when you put on the full armor of God and stand against the wiles of the devil with the shield of faith helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit in your hand. As you ought to be bold. To make known the mystery of the gospel. Verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul writes this while chained for the gospel. He writes this while jailed for the gospel. He writes this, asking them to pray for him that he'll be bold as he ought to be bold, even as he's already in chains for the gospel's sake. Is that not instructive about weakness? For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly, he says it again, as I ought to speak. Oh, friends, there's a war on. We're either in it or we're AWOL, absent without leave. We're either in it daily. Jesus said, die to self, take up your cross daily. Or we're AWOL. The place of life and life abundant in Christ Jesus is in the battle. The place where Jesus is at is in the battle. You go, therefore, back up. I have all authority in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, says the Lord Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. And lo, I'll be with you, even to the end of the age. This is the promise of the Lord Jesus. This is where he abides. This is where we need to be. And this is why I believe you're here, to get trained, equipped, challenged, and to go forth and do the work of the evangelist. 
grab a hold of and get it in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Evangelism's sovereignty is your certain confidence. Grab a hold of evangelism's weapon, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the fire and the hammer, which shall not return void. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word of God. The Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then stand firm against the wiles of the devil with unceasing prayer, utterly dependent upon God, as you have the full armor of God on and the sword of the Spirit in your hand and you wield it boldly boldly as it ought to be wielded boldly even if you're already in chains for having wielded it boldly yesterday let's pray father we thank you for these truths lord write them on our hearts again Write them on our hearts fresh, Lord, this year, this day. If they're new, I pray, Lord, you grant reception, you grant ears to hear, ready submission, Lord. May we not respond like Peter back in that boat with hesitation, with some level of doubt, maybe rebellion even, but let, Lord, gladly and readily get beneath you and serve you and see what You will do through Your mighty and sovereign hand in saving all those whom You're calling to Yourself, all those whom You have given to Your Son. Grant, Lord, that our faith in the ministry of Your Word, which shall not return void, that our faith would increase exponentially. And that we would put feet on it Carry forth that sword this week, this year, and all the years to come until Jesus shall return. Whether 3,000 are saved in a day or we're stripped, whipped, stocked, and put in the inmost chamber. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.